afternoon. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Walters. I've been with BMC uh, since the Remedy acquisition back in the early 2000s. <clears throat> I've worked in uh, customer support and engineering over that time. And 12 months ago, I moved to the, uh, the SEAL team, the solution engineering uh, and architect team. Um, I've been focusing almost full time on the Helix on-prem ITSM systems uh, over that time doing many installations myself uh, and troubleshooting them. So today we're going to have a look at what's involved in the uh, the deployment of the new containerized ITSM uh, ITSM systems. So the So, so the, the agenda for the meeting, uh, we'll have a quick overview. Um, we're going to talk about the, the architecture and sizing of the systems. The, there are a lot of changes from the previous releases that many people are used to, which were, which were server based. The switch to containers and Kubernetes has had a, a, lot, of, a lot of impact on the way the, the, the products are consumed, deployed, and also the, the resources that they use. Uh, we'll look at deployment planning, what's necessary or what's helpful to try and make sure that you get a successful install. The process is, is very different. Um, so there are, there are different things that you need to do. There's different infrastructure that you need to provide um, to, to help you get up and running and we'll go through the over, uh, go through the installation process we're not going to do um, I, it would have been nice to be able to do a demo and, and dig into it in detail but it, it unfortunately it, it just takes too long um, to be able to do that in real time but we uh, I have some screenshots and we'll we'll have a look at the overall the overall process and then there are some references and uh, links later on. So as I say, we're going to have a look at the, the installation, um, the planning and the actual installation process for the Helix ITSM uh, on-prem release, the containerized releases. They're now based on a Kubernetes platform. So whereas before you could run these on, on Windows or Linux VMs, um, on actual bare metal or on hard, sorry, on, on the OS itself, uh, each of those individual components was installed uh, in separately and you could combine and, and pretty much mi pretty much mix and match to make a deployment to suit yourself. The new containerized deployments are uh, almost a, a, a complete solution. So we include smart IT, the remedy platform, uh, BWF, DWP, lots, lots of the the historical ITSM components are now all deployed as a single as a single system. Um, as I say, it uses a, a mix of new and different technologies than probably you're used to. If you if you haven't already had a look at this solution, uh, Kubernetes is probably new. I know many many customers and partners have have little I want to know experience with that. Uh, so we'll have a look and see how that all fits together uh, and um, and what's used. So why has BMC switched to using uh, containers? Well, there are a number of things. The Within the within the business world, IT, there has been a move over the over recent years towards more standardized uh, standardized deployments. The more complex and bigger the packages have got, the harder it is to to deploy and manage them, to install all the separate components. Containerization helps manage some of that complexity. Um, they can be faster to deploy. Um, the resource management is uh, can be more controlled, more granular. Um, they're portable. Uh, the container images are are provided by the by the vendor by us BMC, and we're responsible for all of the contents in them. Uh, we fix them, and once they're released, they're available, uh, and they are uh, they're not they're not met, they're not updated in place. They are replaced with new versions if necessary. So that makes them uh, makes them more manageable. 
containerization, uh, Kubernetes in particular has some advanced features such as, such as auto scaling that some of our products can take advantage of. So that allows for flexible increase and decrease in the resources consumed depending on, on how busy your system is. So particularly maybe for very large customers that are already running containerized environments, um, we can slot in alongside those and, and, and work, work in that way. And also for, for upgrades, um, containerization allows for rolling upgrades and zero downtime. So you can have a, a running system today. You can deploy the new versions, the upgraded versions alongside it. And because many of the services that are part of the ITSM solution are configured as uh, multiple replicas for, for high availability and performance reasons, you can, you can roll those out and replace one at a time so that you don't suffer any down, downtime during your, your upgrades. And also it allows us to run it in many more places. We've got our own BMC Helix cloud and SaaS solution. You can deploy them on-prem or you can use private or public clouds such as um, Amazon or Google, uh, Oracle's cloud systems. Uh, it's available across all of those. So the first step is to talk about the, the architecture and the, the sizing um, of the solution. So the ITSM, uh, IT service management software now sits alongside operations management and other components or other products from BMC making up the service ops offering. And we are, it's taking advantage of a number of common services that are provided by this Helix platform. So when we get to the deployment, uh, the installation and deployment steps later on, you'll see there's there's more than just ITSM being installed. Um, we have this Helix platform layer, which provides things like single sign-on, uh, dashboards functionality, and support for some of the more advanced capabilities, um, the AI type of our ITSM insights. And on top of that, we offer the the, the products themselves, so service management, ITSM, operations management, cost optimization are some of the ones that are available. So if we look inside the, the service management bit and the um, AI ops in particular, you can see there that we've got features coming along related to change management, um, discovery, root cause problem and incident management, as well as the things that you're used to from the previous ITSM. Uh, solutions, we're, we're being able to open up and offer many more new and advanced services. And these these components sit on top of uh, the Helix platform layer, as I, as I mentioned. The architectural overview. Um, you need to provide to start with that there are a number of components that um, the customer or the partner are responsible for providing before you can actually get on and install the platform the installers that we provide will not provision the whole infrastructure for you so this can be uh, you need a kubernetes platform whether that's native kubernetes on premise yourself maybe running on vms or on one of the the bare metal or dedicated container OSs that are available, or whether it's a, a cloud provider such as Google, Oracle, um, Microsoft through Azure. Along with the container, sorry, along with the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes platform, you need a number of uh, additional components. So if we start up at the, the top left hand corner of the diagram, the, the BMC DTR, the Docker Trusted Registry, that's containers.bmc.com, which is an internet accessible registry, image registry server. And that system provides uh, licensed customers with access to all of the container images for the different products that they're licensed for. Um, it is possible to do an installation uh, pulling the images directly from containers.bmc.com, but it's not recommended. So we expect most customers will 
set up or deploy an image registry such as Harbor within their own environment. And that's for a number of reasons. Uh, for performance reasons, it, obviously it makes much more sense if you have the images local to, to where they're being deployed. We're talking um, many gigabytes of, of actual container image that need to be moved around to get the, the installation up and running. So having those available on a local network for performance reasons and also for um, security, uh, perhaps your cluster is air gapped or that you want to put those images through a security security scan of your own to check for any vulnerabilities or concerns and also for um, uh, higher availability. If you're relying on an internet connected registry, there's always the concern that there may be an issue either at our end or with the internet between uh, the containers site and yourselves, which could prevent the deployment or redeployment if an image is needed. We also then have the BMC deployment engine. This is a, uh, a Linux based uh, Red Hat or CentOS 7 or 8 system now where many of the de installation components need to be run. So we'll see those in more detail later, but that's a system that, that you need to set up and the documentation has lots of information that will uh, guide you through that process, including um, setup scripts to help automate it. The deployment manager is a script that's often run on the deployment engine and is the component that actually sets up the uh, the helix platform so the different components that make up the itsm solution we've got a mix of installation technologies uh, again you'll see that shortly and the deployment manager is one of those you need um, DNS and load balancer services to actually get to the get to the products. So a prerequisite for setting up the with a prerequisite for installation is that all of the different product URLs that are used to access the solution are set up within your DNS and that they resolve to a load balancer, which then puts the traffic into your Kubernetes cluster. Um, an ingress controller is a way of mapping those um, URLs. So for example, you'll have a different URL for the mid tier, for smart IT, for dashboards. Um, that ingress controller takes those URLs and sends the, 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 the requests on to the, to the pods within the cluster that are providing, um, providing that service. So that's the basic infrastructure that's needed. The, um, installation process the next step then is to deploy the the helix platform or the common services so this includes a number of shared services that many of the bmc products then can take advantage of so the single sign-on for example the identity and tenant management systems dashboards and reporting capability and all of that sits on top of um, and uses uh, what we call a data lake or the data tier. So we use Postgres, um, Elasticsearch, Redis and several others to help manage the data that all of these common services uh, use. And then there are uh, persistent volumes. So uh, you need a storage solution that allows you to uh, allows the data from these um, these components to persist across pod restarts. Uh, one of the features of Kubernetes and, and containers and pods that are running within it is that they are they're considered ephemeral. Um, and by that I mean that if the pod dis if the pod dies or is killed or decommissioned for any reason, all of the file system that's associated with that pod is is reclaimed and reused. So persistent volumes are a way of having things like databases uh, persist across pod restarts so that the data is also um, is always available. Along with the uh, sitting sort of at the same layer as the as the Helix platform are a number of other uh, product services. So, for example, uh, ITSM Insights uses the AI uh, capabilities and we also that then have operations management and discovery. Which are other products that share some of these components. You'll notice uh, all of these pieces are installed within a, a single namespace. So a Kubernetes namespace is a sort of a logical segregation of uh, application pods. So all of these all of these components fit within within a single namespace. Once those components are installed, the next step is to create a, a namespace for the Helix Innovation Suite or ITSM. 
um, and the various IS and ITSM components and pods are installed within that. So we have separate pods for the mid tier, smart IT, uh, the platform, and various other integration and uh, assistant pods to help combine that. And they communicate with um, with some of the pods that are running in the Helix platform namespace, as I as I mentioned earlier, for things like single sign-on and, and for the dashboards and reporting. Uh, the Helix uh, ITSM database, you'll notice up at the top right hand corner there, is, is outside of the cluster. So we uh, we require that, um, that that's also provided uh, a database server, Oracle, SQL or Postgres are, are available or supported. Um, and you'll have, depending on the database chosen, you may have a, a step to install a database backup to restore a, state of a database backup um, before installation. And then the final component uh, or the piece in the in the puzzle is the BMC Helix logging namespace. Um, all of the pods in the Helix platform namespace at the bottom there all of their logging output is uses container standards and Kubernetes standards, and they log to the pod standard out um, dis output, which means you have a component running, uh, the Fluent D component running up at the top right there, which can collect all of those up, store them in Elastic, and then Kibana is available to actually query them. And that's obviously that that's key for troubleshooting. Um, so if we need to understand if there's a problem with one of those services, the logs from them all are, are combined that way and are very uh, can be searched very effectively and very flexibly using those components. There's a slightly different um, bit of logging technology used for some of the innovation suite, the ITSM uh, software, and that's the support assistant tool. So, for example, those of you that are familiar with the, the, the AR, the Remedy platform um, from previous versions, the filter API and SQL logs, that type of information that you're used to using is still available, but we need to have a, a way to get that out of the pods uh, in, if it's needed for troubleshooting. So the support assistant tool is a, a web interface uh, that allows you to do that. The Helix platform um, is natively supports multi-tenancy. Um, and so by that, I mean it's possible to have more than one uh, ITSM instance running on top of it. So for example, uh, one way to reduce the, the resources required for, for a, say for a dev and a QA or a development and testing instance is rather than give each one of them their own dedicated Helix platform, uh, it's possible as seen in the, the left hand side of this diagram here, that you can have a, a single Helix, sorry on the right hand side, you can have a, a single Helix platform namespace and installation and then within that you can create multiple tenants and each one of those tenants can be associated with an ITSM instance. So that's, um, that's a helpful way for, for smaller development systems to, to require less resources. And um, as on the previous slide, the, the Helix platform, as well as supporting ITSM, also supports the operations management, cost optimization, and other, and other BMC products. The sizing um, of the solution has uh, is can be complex, so we've broken uh, BMC have broken down the the sizing into what we call the t-shirt sizes: small, medium, and large. And we provide uh, we provide guidance on how many users we expect you to be able to support for each of the different sizings. Uh, the compact sizing is intended for development and testing, so it's not a it's not intended for production use. Uh, the resilient concurrent users column gives you an idea of how many users we expect you to be able to support um, with ex with um, performance metrics that meet our testing requirements even if one of the, for example, one of the nodes in your cluster is taken down for maintenance. So allowing for the, the sort of day-to-day -day running and maintenance of a system, a small environment would be able to support a maximum of 400 concurrent users uh, working across a mix of the different components. But um, should you lose one of your bits of hardware for some reason, 
uh, if it's been properly architected, we'd still be able to expect to, to support 200 users without any significant um, degradation in performance. The CPU and RAM numbers, the requirements that are included here or shown here, they, um, they represent the total resources that need to be available for the compute nodes or for the worker nodes across your cluster. So a Kubernetes cluster consists of um, several, one or more worker nodes and usually several uh, what are called controlled pl control plane nodes. So the control plane or master nodes are responsible for managing the, the, the applications and the pods, the systems and software that actually run Kubernetes. And then the, the applications themselves run on the worker nodes. So your, um, we also provide some guidance on the, or requirements on the, the minimum no, the minimum CPU and RAM requirements for individual worker nodes. So you are free to, uh, there's been a bit of confusion about how the, how to combine the two. So the way the way to think of it is the the total compute, compute, compute resources. So the numbers in the top table are what you need to provide that number of concurrent users. You're free to build uh, a cluster that provides those resources using any combination of worker nodes as long as they meet the minimum requirements. Um, so I've just spotted a typo there. The, the small minimum node CPU should also be eight and not 10. So there should be three eights and, and one 10. So for example, you could have a, a, a smaller number of very capable nodes or a larger number of uh, less powerful nodes as long as they all meet the minimum requirements. Um, but whatever you have or a combination of the two, but whatever you have must in total provide the, the figures from the top there. The persistent storage is constant across all of the, the sizings at the moment. Um, it's possible we may do some work to be able to reduce that as obviously you, you wouldn't expect a, a small system to um, to require exactly the same storage as a very large system. Um, but currently these are the, the sizes or the sum of the size of the different persistent volumes that are, are provisioned when you do an installation. And um, the low the, the node local storage requirement is the the disk that needs to be present on each of the worker nodes to allow for um, the storage of images uh, that are being run on that node, but also for the the file systems of the pods that are running. So, for example, if it was an innovation an I, uh, innovation suite an IS platform pod, i.e. the 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 old AR server, the um, the the logs that we're used to, the SQL and filter API logs, for example, they would live within the, the file system of the pod uh, during the time it was running. And that would be resident on the, on the local storage of the node um, <clears throat> where it's being run. Uh, for high availability, um, you, we recommend that you, or well, you, you need uh, at least three master nodes uh, to allow for, uh, for failure or, or for maintenance. Um, the master node specification, uh, we recommend that you, you follow the best practices from Kubernetes because that will depend on, uh, on um, whether you have anything else running on your cluster uh, and exactly what combination of nodes you use. So it's um, you need to do a little bit of, uh, a bit of research there just to find out um, exactly what's required. So we've had a look at the architecture that's required. The next thing um, before we actually start an installation is to, uh, to do a little bit of planning to maximize the chances of, of success. Uh, the Platinum Engineering team here within BMC is creating um, a reference architecture project, a reference architecture documentation project to help customers understand the deployment requirements and also to ensure that you, know, you get the best value from the from the BMC products. So that compri comprises of three sort of three different components at this point. There's the day zero section, which is what we're talking about today, and that's all about planning and preparing the platform, uh, the validation, 
of the, the, the input values that you're going to be using for the installation and the prerequisites in terms of the infrastructure. Uh, all of those things can be checked before you actually attempt an install to, to maximize the chances of it, um, of it completing uh, successfully. The day one architect or the day one documents, this is the, the reference architecture. Uh, detailing the different components. So we have some we have some documents available that go into uh, dig a little bit deeper into how the different some of the different components that make up the solution actually work. So if you're interested in um, getting into the into the depths of how the different systems interact, uh, some of the some mm -hmm. of the papers there will be useful. And then the day day two use cases. So those are intended. Um, uh, to provide specific examples. So for uh, for example, dashboards, how to build certain types of operational dashboard, and they are we adding to those as they become available and as we as we we're able to create them. And these are going to be available as part of the, the BMC product documentation um, if uh, shortly. If you want them ahead of that, um, uh, feel free to uh, raise a support case or talk to somebody, one of your contacts within BMC, and if they uh, they can reach out to the SEAL team and Platinum Engineering to be able to to get those. The day zero documents are, um, I would say, they're essential really for actually planning uh, an installation, and they they come in two parts. Um, the first part is an evaluation of the current system if you're doing an upgrade um, and the hardware and the, the environment that you want to target to create. So it's what you have now and what, what you would like to have once the installation is complete. So the, the reason for asking these questions is it gives us, it gives BMC um, a much better idea of, of your level of competence and understanding of the different technologies. Uh, it helps us plan and provide information to you on the sizings that you need. So depending on how many users you have and which products you want to use, that will that can move the move the dial on the different hardware requirements. So we can make sure that you start with the, the right platform um, to get the installation up and running. Uh, and it's also then useful for identifying any any potential problems. So for example, if you have specific integrations or software requirements um, that you need to you need to be able to maintain or implement with the new solution, it means that uh, if there are any potential problems there, we, we can see them in advance and, and do some work to make sure that we can support what you need to do. So the, the plan and prepare that the first day zero document is uh, the intention is that you complete this as you as you start planning your deployment um, and then you can use that, uh, provide that back to BMC and get feedback uh, on whether there are any issues and get advice on sizing. Once the uh, installation, uh, once the planning is complete or the, the first step of the planning, we have then a plan and prepare checklist. So this goes into much more detail on the, the various installation steps. So uh, as you'll see shortly, the, the, the different products that are installed, uh, it's, the re it's the responsibility of the customer or requirement that the customer provides things like product uh, host names, URLs, uh, passwords, credentials, all of that kind of thing need to be input into either configuration files or into the installation tool to allow the, the, the system to be installed. It's important that all of those or as many of those as possible we can validate and understand that they're correct before you start. So the checklist runs through almost line by line uh, and provides you with uh, links to the documentation so that you can read more about them if you don't understand exactly what's being asked, along with a both a verification step and the type of output that's expected to make sure that the system is in the state that we uh, that we require before you before you begin an install. So that would be in, that would include things like checking that URLs exist and are resolvable, storage is present and of the right size, uh, that the Kubernetes namespace exists, that that type of thing. So all of the key steps, all of the key requirements can, can be documented, understood, and uh, validated. So just sort of taking um, a step back. 
before you can begin an install, these are some of the or these are the key components um, that are required as part of the infrastructure. You need a Kubernetes platform that can be native Kubernetes. It can be OpenShift uh, as well as one or more of the, the cloud platform providers, cloud Kubernetes providers. You need a database server, SQL, Oracle or Postgres that's external to the cluster that your um, that your IS database can be restored to. Um, you need an SMTP server for uh, mail. Many of the products obviously can send email messages, but also dur during the installation, uh, there is a, a, a one or more email messages generated that contain information about the, the Helix platform tenant that you'll need to receive. A load balancer to actually get the traffic into the into the cluster in a reliable and available way. The Nginx ingress controller. So this is the component which um, when the traffic comes from your load balancer into the cluster, it maps the, the, the URL that you've requested. So for example, a mid tier or a smart IT URL, and it redirects your request to the appropriate pod that's providing uh, that service within the cluster. Uh, you'll need an SSL certificate. All of the all of the communication that we do with the outside world for the services is now done via HTTPS. So you will need to provide a SSL certificate that matches the, the different product URLs. This is one of the limitations in uh, earlier releases of the product of the, the on-prem product where we only supported a, a, a couple of um, providers. You can now uh, now even use a self-signed certificate if required. You'll need a image registry server. Uh, Harbor is an example that we include and or that we sorry, not that we include that we provide and document uh, that we provide documentation for. So that uh, allows you to to store all of the images locally. Um, we have within our documentation um, some scripts and examples of details of how you can set up replication from containers.bmc.com to your own image registry server to make sure all of the images are present um, before you start the installation. You need the block storage for persistent volumes. And again, the, the documentation has some specifications regarding the, the read and write speeds um, that, that are needed to, um, to support this. And then all of the, the different product URLs that you want to use uh, have to be actually be registered and resolvable uh, within your DNS. One other component to mention before we actually move on to looking at the uh, how the installation is done is the health check tool. So this is a, a tool that's been developed by, um, by a member of the SEAL team and it works for both the Helix platform and ITSM uh, and it allows you to validate many of the input configuration parameters before you run an install. So you would um, you would get the system set up ready to install. You would configure all of the input files that with all of your own parameters or your own values. But before you actually uh, commit and start the installation process, you can use the health check tool and that will read the same configuration files that the, the products itself uses, the installation uses, and then runs a number of checks. So for example, it will deploy some pods um, to make sure that the that, that can be done successfully. It will validate the namespaces, check certificates, uh, check that the IS database exists and has been restored if appropriate. So many of the many of the, the common problems that we've seen uh, with customers that or both with customers and with our own testing uh, where we found a uh, we found that there's something we can validate. We're adding that to this to this health check tool. So you'll be using that twice, once for the Helix platform and, and once for the for the ITSM process. So now we'll have a look at uh, what's actually included or what's actually required to do the installation. Again, to start with with just an overview. So these these are these are the high level steps that you'll need to go through uh, once you've got your Kubernetes cluster up and running. So you'll need to sync the images from containers.bmc.com to your own uh, to your own local registry, Harbor, Artifactory, JFrog. We've we've had customers using many different uh, different types. As I say, we document uh, how to use Harbor, uh, but others others are others are supported and and do work. 
you'll need to create the, the various Kubernetes namespaces, one for the platform, one for ITSM, and one for Helix logging. The deployment engine needs to be built. Again, the documentation has, um, has detailed steps and, and a setup script now that will help you do that, uh, get that ready. Uh, validate the environment the, for the Helix platform with the health check tool, and then actually perform the installation. So that's a, a, a shell script, a Unix shell script based install that deploys all of the different Helix platform uh, or common services pods. Once they're up and running, you'll need to uh, make some changes, configuration updates within the RSSO system that's deployed. So that's to enable the, the various ITSM products to be able to, to, for, to map their URLs to the correct tenant within the Helix platform for authentication. The IS database, the ITSM or IS database needs to be restored uh, to your database server. Uh, that's uh, that's mandatory. It's required for both Oracle and SQL Server. Uh, it's optional for Postgres. Um, the reason it's optional for Postgres is the the installation pipelines, as you'll see shortly, they they have an option which allows it to do the the restore for you. So you still need to provide the the Postgres database, but there's no need to actually set up the the AR system database and do the restore yourself. The the installation pipeline can do that for the for a Postgres database. And then again, we've got the uh, the health check tool. Validate your IS your ITSM uh, input parameters and values before you actually commit to install uh, to look for any potential problems. And then the installation of ITSM is done using a, a tool called Jenkins and Jenkins pipelines, which are the, the scripts that are the, the, the perform the installation. For the Helix platform uh, component, there are two or three text based files that need to be edited. So within the within the installation directories for the system, you'll find a configs directory that has uh, has these templates and it's necessary to go through and, and fill in the blanks effectively. So you need to provide, for example, the name of your namespace you can see on the screen there, um, the, the URLs and port numbers for the different uh, for the load balancer that you've set up that you want to use to access the products and then the the image the image registry username and the host that you're using and there's there's, there's a reasonably long list uh, probably about 50 or so parameters that need to be provided in this file and this is the same file that then that as I mentioned the, the health check tool uses um, and validates the contents of before you start the install. And then the installation itself is done by running the deployment manager script. It's uh, not very interesting to look at. It's all text based output uh, that will scroll across the screen as it as it progresses and you'll see the various components um, being deployed. And if you have a, a Kubernetes management tool uh, available, you'll be able to have a look and you'll see the different uh, Kubernetes objects, the pods and services being created and deployed. Um, as that as that runs through and that will take probably anything up to an hour um, depending on on the options selected and then the power of the systems that you're using but it's, uh, it's that's that sort of order of magnitude to actually get the helix platform installed once that's done um, you need to make some changes in RSSO. So the uh, RSSO or HSSO as it is now component is installed as part of the Helix platform and provides the authentication services for all of the all of the products. Um, but you need to be able to link that to your ITSM system. So you need to go in and set up the, the different URLs that you're going to be using. Um, the tenant, there's a tenant automatically created for you by the by the Helix platform deployment, there is a default tenant provided, and that um, the, the example at the bottom of the screen there, the, the red dot number, that's a tenant ID, which is also required as part of the, the Helix ITSM installation. So you need to get that. Uh, you need to make a note of that when you set up the and you set up the, the RSSO realm. 
once the RSSO realm is configured, then it's over into Jenkins, which is the, the GUI tool that is used to actually do the ITSM installation. So as I said, this consists of a number of different uh, what we call pipelines or what Jenkins calls pipelines, which are individual scripts that do the various do the various deployments of different components. There's only one pipeline that's actually directly run, and that's the Helix on-prem deployment pipeline, sometimes called the, you might hear it called the Uber pipeline. That's the one where you provide all of the, the input values, um, and then it calls the other pipelines uh, depending on the product options that are selected, and that um, runs through and actually does the deployment of the, of the system. This is just some examples of the types of information that you need to provide in the in the uh, in the Uber pipeline. So again, it's things like the the cluster specific information, the name of the the name of the namespace, uh, the cluster domain, uh, the ingress class. You also get to uh, select the various product options um, that are available. So the platform deploy obviously does the the remedy platform, the AR platform, the mid tier. Uh, Non-platform is smart IT and then the smart apps are things like uh, business workflows and digital workplace. So those are individual pipelines um, that are run and there are credentials to do with the database and that type of thing. All of the input values um, that are used and again there is an option to use the, the, the recommended to use the health check tool to validate some of these uh, before you actually click the button to start the installation. Um, pipeline execution, uh, you can keep an eye on what's going on. Uh, there's a sort of console type scrolling text output that will show you stage by stage what the what the pipeline's doing. The, uses a, a combination of um, other tools such as Helm, Ansible, uh, kubectl, lots of different uh, third-party tools are actually used to, to prepare the templates that do the installation and, and configure Kubernetes to run the pods, but you'll be able to, it's useful for troubleshooting, so if you have an issue scrolling through this might give you a, an error message for example, or at least show you the exact stage that the, the installation failed at, um, which means you know, obviously then make Maybe I can go back and review the input parameters that you provided. And then there's also a, a, a higher level graphical view of the various different stages. Uh, end to end, the IS deployment takes between probably between three and four hours. Again, depending on the, the, the power of the system and the options selected, but it, it's that sort of order of magnitude and that will take you from uh, uh, effectively an empty namespace to having a, a running system complete with all of the different uh, products up and running. So you'll be able to go to your mid-tier URL, uh, digital workplace, smart IT and uh, and log in. And at that point you have a you have a working ITSM system. And you should be able to should be able to go and have a look and begin planning your 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 data migration. Brief mention of some of the technologies um, that are required. So if you are looking, if it's, this is all new to you and you're looking for, for more information and education areas and what, what do you need to focus on? Uh, this is, um, these are the types of technologies that we're using. At the top there, we've got the different Kubernetes platforms, um, then the installation technologies, Jenkins and Harbor, and then some of the actual products that are used within the within the solutions. So Kibana is used for, for the logging um, and then Kafka, Redis, uh, Elasticsearch are all infrastructure components. You probably won't have to interact with them directly, but if you if you want to um, you want to get your skills up, this is the area. Uh, these are the areas in which you in which you can focus and um, are the technologies that the, the solutions are using. That concludes this afternoon's presentation. I hope you all found it useful. Thank you very much and back over to you, Sam.